Hi, I'm Diane McGarry from Drink It Arts. We're so excited to be sharing our artists with you today. We are recording this session, so if you don't wish to be part of the recording, please turn off your mic and turn off your video. Otherwise, we're very glad to have you here. And also put any questions you might have for Patrice in the chat and we will go through them during the course of her reading. Patrice Panet, oh my gosh, I'm so glad that she's joining us today. She's inspired by alchemy between the arts in her own practice and in collaboration with other artists, writers and musicians in workshops, readings and exhibits. She brings the love of literature and writing to Antioch University's New England's Masters of Education in Waldorf Education, transdisciplinary focus on healing education, the Center for Anthropos Anthroposophy's renewal courses, and to adult learners of English in New Hampshire Humanities Connection Program. Patrice received her MFA in writing from Vermont College of Fine Arts, and her poems have appeared in Poet Showcase, an anthology of New, New Hampshire poets, and recently released anthology, COVID Spring, from Granite State Pandemic Poems, edited by Alexandria Perry. This is actually available through the Drake at Arts gift shop. Thank you so much, Patrice, for coming. It's so wonderful to have you with us today. Thank you, Diane. It's my pleasure. Um, thank you for inviting me and Tom also. Um, it was great meeting you, Tom, and I'm glad to be in a Drake at Arts event today. Also, Diane, I have to thank you for scheduling this on, on this first day of spring. Yes. <laughs> and um, it feels auspicious, um, an extra um, boon for the poetry, I feel. So thank you. And of course, welcome to everyone who's joining me and us today, um, wishing you all really a brighter season and a very happy spring. So I'd like to begin actually with some spring poems, spring related poems. And um, Diane, I still have you as in the speaker view. Do you see it otherwise? We are solely focused on you now. Oh, okay. <laughs> Very, I have a very different perspective, but I'm very happy to, to see you. Um, spring is a complicated time. Um, we have tremendous hopes for spring every year. Of course, last year, many of those hopes were dashed um, by what was happening in our world. Um, I'd like to start with something that is more innocent and then share with you a few perspectives on spring um, that convey some of the complexity of it. This first poem is called Spring Cherry. One span of sky, the sun had just been by, gave light a concentration I could catch. Illumination splayed across the day was gathered in the glow. How could I have known the hill's crown would settle on me so? Out of the blue, the sun slipped down, and I arose, flowering cherry in spring's moist ground. So speaking of complexity, um, I'd like to read you a couple of poems, one very short, related to an event um, that affected a magnolia tree in a devastating way although it has lived to tell the tale and so have I. <laughs> um, this is Magnolia in a Killing Frost. And um, there's really a, a gorgeous, a stupendous magnolia tree up on Abbot Hill Road in Wilton. And day after day through the seasons, um, I would walk past this tree and anticipate it's just beautiful blossoms. Um, but one season it bloomed too soon and um, we could see just these gorgeous buds in the beginning of this opening. Um, and sadly, the killing frost changed everything. Um, what was remarkable to me was how deeply affected I was by it. And I've, <laughs> it, it um, invited a lot of meditating for me on how deeply this touched my soul. So um, this is Magnolia in a Killing Frost. The first one, was my effort to um, condense a story and an experience into just a few words. Petals only just 
in first flush. A thousand buds still waiting their turn to turn to birds to blessing fell. And now in number two, I'll just tell you I conflated two, two magnolias. Um, there was the one I described to you. And then for many years, I was teaching at a high school um, and the school would celebrate May Day in a glorious way with Maypole dancing. And before the boys and girls, young men, young women um, came forth to do the Maypole dance in the center of the green, um, they waited under a beautifully arching magnolia. And there they waited for the guests to join. And then they came out with their bells and, and music and, and spirit of dance. So here it is. I wanted to climb into flowering branches and watch the dancers shake their ankle bells, soft white skirts twirling, the girls' hair garlanded and loose, the boys' white pants rolled, white sleeves flapping as they circled barefoot to the tambourine, ribbons weaving over and under whatever wind was blowing. Later I slept as frost pressed and pinched then rose stiffly to the tree, spring fed and sun bestowed. I'd felt untimely warmth, a gift myself, and miracle enough to lift my heart again. But my face rose and fell among the leaves where bird blossoms bloomed too soon and perfectly, all ice. From pink petals to rusted rouge, then cracked and brown as leather. Can joy be premature, dependent on a thing like weather? Mm -hmm. Seasonless, lichens, blue-gray scales on speckled granite. The world grew older overnight, I nearly said, but that wasn't right. I could take it in stride and bent to daffodils that survived the night. That is so precious. <laughs> the, the funny part about it is, you know, I, I said I could take it in stride, but it took many, many versions <laughs> of writing poems about this event. Um, um, but I did my best to take it in stride. <laughs> Wait for the following year. Um, question. It says, um, Tori asks, you've been a poet for many years. As your perspective on life evolves as the years pass, how has your relationship with poetry evolved as well? When you became a parent, did that affect your palette for poetry? Um, Tori, this is such a, such a far reaching question. Um, I think that um, some of my original passion for poetry um, hasn't dimmed over the decades. <laughs> um, but I do think that over time, um, I've become more willing to experiment with form and to trust silence. I think I'm more aware um, that um, silence is a player in the realm of poetry. Um, and as I say, I'm trying to experiment with that a little bit more. Um, the thing about having children, I mean, aside as you know so well, um, some of the time I might lavish on writing and creative pursuits um, initially was um, just went into life, you know, went into life. Someone recently, my dear friend um, in attendance today reminded me that, um, you know, putting creativity, creating a life, is one of the great arts too. Um, but I also think that poetry and many of the arts, and I'll, I'll bring this out a little bit later too, um, plays with this theme of in intimacy, um, wanting to use the arts to become closer to the world and to each other. And as parents, right, we experience intimacy like we have never known before. <laughs> and, um, and as you'll see, my children even, um, as adults, you know, have inspired my poetry. So um, I hope that's good enough answer. 
Um, of but course. I'll just add here, Tori and I had a conversation recently about, you mm -hmm. know, the kind of poem that might draw more energy and activity and obsession even, I'll say, um, to, you know, compared to other poems. And what I was describing about the Magnolia, um, I have many, many versions, and that is one that I think touched on so many um, mysterious and um, universal themes mm -hmm. about happiness and grief, about the connection between nature and the human soul, um, the experience of aging, um, all those things could not be covered easily and quickly. And um, perhaps I'll return to that, you know, some of those drafts in future. So Tori, thanks so much for your question. Sure. Randy and I also actually love the music of the last poem and the rhythm. It's oh. wonderful to hear rhyme again, because it, it's not used as much as it used to be. It's considered trite, which it isn't always. Yeah, I think the music mm. is um, a great element I, I strive for often. Yeah. Um, just staying a little longer on this uh, spring theme, um, you know, T.S. Eliot is famous for saying that April is the cruelest month. <laughs> so I am not telling you anything new when I say that um, partly because of what's happening in nature, um, the light filled airiness, the color coming back into the world, um, we would expect and why not to, to reflect that, to mirror that, to have a lightness in our step, but then it makes more acute the ways that we still bear the heaviness of, of dark, of weight and all of that. So this commemorates a little bit of that um, tension. Um, so my husband Gary and I had a, a beautiful dogwood tree. Um, it was here with the house when we moved in. We loved it. It inspired Gary's poems and songs and just became an iconic thing. But eventually the, the dogwood split and um, had to go. And the dogwood itself isn't addressed per se, but I'll just tell you the title is Dogwood Split, Leaning Against the Screen. Some people know the names of a hundred flowers and flowering trees. I wish I could be like them. It's not easy to be angry in spring. Everywhere plants have forgiven the frost, unfurl like newborns no memory. A friend can become an enemy overnight. Next morning, magnolia's soft pink petals, frozen solid. Then the ground softens. Tulips, crocus, hyacinth and daffodils, the most sentimental bulbs bloom in spring. This year I plant gladiolas, they take longer, of course, grow much taller, and keep opening along the stem, even as the first gorgeous blossoms shrivel and fall. Fiddleheads, another great sign that seasons change. Waiting in the dark for spring, See a peony already blooms in the next season, the next life. Across the bridge of snow and sleet, who will be alive come spring? Not too bitter to pull watercress from the stream. Not too lonely to pick fiddlehead ferns. So um, staying with this idea of, of contrast, um, coming into this spring, we can't help but remember um, last spring and the paradox that brought with the pandemic and um, how we had to weigh um, the relief of warmer days, the beauty of the season. Um, we had to weigh that with our fear and um, loneliness our separation from one another. And um, at that time, um, our family had the great joy of knowing that our daughter, Ariana, um, was expecting a child. And, um, and we couldn't feel completely um, 
just the lightheartedness, um, the exhilaration without being aware of how that was differentiated from what so many were experiencing. And so part of our, our human um, calling is to contain the opposites. And, and this poem, Pregnancy During a Pandemic, was uh, something of my attempt to um, hold the polarities um, during that momentous time on more than one level. We talk about happiness while the grief of nations far exceeds the number of its masks. But don't say lightness of heart is mere defense, pretense or defiance in the face of contagion. Rather, this wish made flesh, this uprush of joy serious enough takes its place in the vast play of history and prophecy end times towards, what else? Birth. Mm -hmm. Expecting at the mercy of everything, time, touch, togetherness. Who will go out too soon? Sooner or late, world wonders and fears press in with their weight. Counterweight, floating sunrise. From quiet, Words blossom beyond sorrows, dreaming of baby names, counting the days, immunity for all. Uh, so now a year later, um, we have a marvelous grandson <laughs> in our life and hopefully we're heading toward greater immunity and freedom for all. Um, the question of um, intimacy and distance, though, is not restricted to um, the pandemic. And um, it's, it's one of those, again, um, things we could ponder, the role of distance uh, in the most intimate relationships. Um, in what sense does it play its part um, for the good? Um, as well as challenge. Um, so this poem is called Jonah's Camera. And um, when Jonah was, my son was studying photography in Boston, um, one day he called me and he said, um, mom, I, I'd like you to come and uh, come down to Boston. I wanna photograph you in the Arboretum uh, for a class project. And um, you know, my heart leapt. <laughs> um, and it was a memorable day um, in more ways than one. So you'll, you'll hear. The only thing I also I should add um, aside, Cezanne is noted because um, the, uh, the challenge of um, finding um, the most intimate and the most objective um, perspective as artists, art, visual artists, as well as others, um, is, is just a theme that, that we have to work with. And uh, Merleau-Ponty was the French philosopher who comments on um, Cezanne in the end. All right, Jonah's camera. At the Arboretum, my son took photos of me in a tree and in a field of marsh grass. I was dwarfed wherever I stood. It's important to see your mother small and getting smaller in the frame. Even the kitchen pots grow heavier when she's not looking. When you photograph your mother, the hand that snaps the shutter is forgotten. Like a lost child. In a dream once, I lost my son. There is nothing more terrible. I woke and he was grown. Now he's staring at something about me I'll never know. Cezanne spoke of getting the right distance. So find your standpoint, take a light reading and make your argument. Only ideas have weight. We lighten as we age, our water evaporates and our fire begins to flow. Said, Merle, said Merleau-Ponty of Cezanne, to hold is to hold at a distance. Mm -hmm. To hold is to hold at a distance. 
Well, the paradox in that one line <laughs> from a great philosopher. This next poem is called Choreography. Um, and it was inspired by a story written by uh, the writer Barry Lopez. Um, Barry Lopez gave a talk about writing at Vermont College when I was studying there. Um, and I remember, I mean, it was just the greatest talk about writing ever. I just cried all the way from, from the auditorium to, to my next class. It was inspiring. But the story that I read called Winter Herons um, had some puzzling elements and um, see what you think. The story bothered me. It was beautiful, but didn't go anywhere. There was a lover loving as if from a distance. He admired her on and off the stage, a dancer. The heart, where was it? Ah, landing on the island between uptown and downtown traffic in the middle of Manhattan on a snowy evening. Great blue herons. They were settling a while under the pale light of street lamps. White field open in the middle of the man waiting, watching them wait before shaking off their wings and rising to an inaudible chord. The whole troop stroking the storm as one heading north. If you ever read that story, I'd love to talk about it. Um, it was only through writing that I thought um, sometimes where our heart is anchored is um, unexpected. And I just felt the intimacy of the man with those tremendous, beautiful birds um, made everything else pale. That moment when time stopped and he was one in that moment with them. So I'm going to read um, another poem that um, mentions a heron. As opposite time of season, it was written late summer last year. And um, as I mentioned to Tori's question, um, I wanted to experiment a little more with space on the page and quiet between the words. So this is called Late. Late. In the flight of a heron, death of a fish. In wind stirred lake, mountain peak breaks to bits, clouds too. Desiring to quell sadness, the heart of a sun flower. What we wanted to say. Only heat lightning, crickets, quelling what else, silence. Um, let's see. Maybe a couple more and then we'll see if there are any comments or questions before another batch. Um, this, I will read this, I just questioned it, but I'm gonna go ahead. Um, in search of pleasure. Um, I'm sure you join me, many of you, in um, the timeless wish for ecstasy and <laughs> Um, the recreating the most precious experiences. And I don't know if you've also shared, um, you know, having a taste of something, whether, you know, that first, you know, raspberry of the season or something that someone has, you know, given you that they've baked or going to a restaurant and having the most marvelous meal. And then next time, it just, it, it didn't, it just doesn't have the same numinous rush of um, experience. So a little bit of a play on that, in search of pleasure. The almond croissant was divine. Then it wasn't. What was it? The air damp, the baker downcast, even the salt and sugar clashed. 
I considered a fast, an apple, a pear, a cookbook. How hard can it be to mix and roll, fill and fold and bake? Today, I weigh desire against restraint. Happiness falls like crumbs from a perfect feast. It must have been a wedding, the bride ecstatic, then content, later restless, shelling almonds, measuring flour, sugar, salt. Um, let's see. The piece in this poem and the last one, do you utilize space on the page as well as in the readings? When you lay them out on the page? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I mean, many of um, they're really, they're quite different, some of them. I mean, I guess, let's see if, if I can hold it up and if you can get a, a sense of this. Oh, yes. Um, so yeah. that's more, that's less usual for me, but it was a, a good experiment and, and reminds me, it's like a musical score sure. of where to leave space. And then um, sometimes just read, then if I were to read it again, it would be a little bit different, you know, as maybe as a musician can, you know, have a riff too. Um, and then this In Search of Pleasure um, does have more typical stanzas. Yeah. And then, um, and then there you have one that's just all one column, short lines, um, and that's um, it's showing me where to have some emphasis, but where I'm giving somehow um, expression by my voice that um, a word can sometimes be seen from two perspectives: the line it ends and the line that it links to. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, good. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I guess I, I'll just have, um, I'll read two more, more poems and then I'd like to stop and just take some questions and talk a little bit um, before another section of, of pieces. Um, I won't give any explanation. Um, this one is called Listening. Listening to the dear bird nearest the heart in its cradle of pine, swaddled by sunlight, a canopy of emerald, we feel we are close to beginning the end. Say it again. Listening to the dear bird nearest the heart in its cradle of pine, swallowed by, sorry, swaddled by sunlight, a canopy of emerald, we feel we are close to beginning the end and wait for what comes to defy reason. Mm -hmm. The coracle of the soul, a shell empty of its swimmer, all liquid for a season, until dripping lake water on rough sand, we discover the loons have left for the dark sea, left us alone to make amends to the land and beings we have undone all. But the voices rearranged by wind into something other than we know. Summer, when whatever flows begins to go away, even daylight gets smaller. Watch the horizon as it sets behind one mountain quietly changing its shape feather by feather. Even daylight gets smaller. Opposite time of the year. Even daylight gets smaller. Watch this horizon as it sets behind one mountain quietly changing its shape feather by feather. I, 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 I almost mentioned and forgot, but I'll just add now, and I, I trust you're coming along with me, that um, we have the seasons that um, define so much of our experience, 
but um, I, I feel like really um, I'm taking the liberty of sharing seasons of the soul, really, which are not limited necessarily to the calendar. No, of course. And so uh, just before taking a pause, I'll just say, um, I was struck when I looked back and I was putting together a sequence of pieces um, that this refers to different, um, different pacings of time, different times it takes to change things. Um, and, you know, there's the change of the loons are leaving, of course, you know, and this is predictable for the most part. Um, it's predictable, the days will get, you know, the light will grow now and get greater. And there's that time when we know the dark will prevail um, and be longer than the light. But then in the end, it's the mountain quietly changing its shape, feather by feather, um, as the birds come and go from the peak and so on. And um, I just say that as a kind of background to this next piece, where um, a single moment can completely change a life. And um, so this poem is called Years Before Calamity. And, um, and uh, our family experienced quite a blow um, just about six months ago when my husband was in a very serious accident. And um, he's made a remarkable recovery, which is still ongoing. Um, but as I would just, you know, flipping through things in my journal, um, questions for the doctors, notes from, uh, from his, you know, appointments and all that. Um, I also came across a memory um, fairly recently that I had written of a time of um, just such um, harmony. And um, we were much younger then. <laughs> I mean, we had our children and all that, but um, but I think somehow the mind will do that. And and I know there are times where I want to just um, press stop, you know, on a special moment, you know, stop the tape running um, that that I know I, I may need this. I may need this refuge um, to remember, to remember. And so um, this is called Years Before Calamity. From a narrow wooden walkway, watching clear sky moonrise over and across tidal flow, Anisquam River lights, sheen, sheer listening to the lap against pilings and boat sides. Wedding party music behind us, the distance before, unimaginable dark that nearly took you returned you. The clouds were ribbons. Remember the end of the night, edge of the dock, ocean air, belonging. Unimaginable dark that nearly took you, returned you. The clouds were ribbons. Remember the end of the night, edge of the dock, ocean air, belonging. So thank you for your concentration and listening. Um, does anyone have any questions? Take a little bit of a... Sure. Break. Iona made a comment. She said, a loud group of geese flew by her window as you read about the heron. Oh, who said that? Iona. Iona? Oh my gosh, <laughs> wonderful. And it created a lovely coincidence, so atmosphere. Do you find inspiration in coincidence or confluence? Yes, I do. Yes. Um, confluence is a be beautiful word too. Um, and I think sometimes, and I know I'm not alone with this, that writers take the liberty, <laughs> you know, of, of conflating different times, different places that have a very special link. Um, yes, that I think, and also um, the element of surprise. And I think that's where coincidence also comes in. Coincidence takes us by surprise. Um, and 
again, my, that meditation on the magnolia is just when something that's least expected occurs, um, there's something weirdly poetic about it. Um, you know, those you know, two unlikely things together. Um, so yes, it's a good question too. Anything else, anyone? I love how you used so many flowers and bloomings. My mother actually marked the year according to what bloomed in her yard. Magnolias, it just so happened, bloomed for my birthday. <laughs> So that was um, very special to hear those. But a lot of us mark time through blossomings and bloomings and fadings as well. That's right. That's right. Well, I'll, I'll read some more. I have one question, if I may. So I see you're reading from paper. Yes. <laughs> and uh, not a computer screen, not memorized, but from paper. So could you just say a little bit about that and how you, uh, yes, craft your poems. I, I assume you write on paper, but do you cross out or do you rewrite the whole thing or just say a little bit about how you do that, please? Sure, sure. Um, I do initially write on paper and I have, um, I have usually um, at least one journal, if not more, going. And, um, but it's very rough. And so it just, you know, I try to just let what come comes, whatever associations. And so when I type it, I mean, sometimes I'll cross out as I'm writing, but mostly I try to just let it come through. Um, and then it's a whole different creative process when I'm typing. So when I go to the keyboard um, and sometimes it's uh, not unrecognizable, but it's, it's a transformed piece by the time I finish the first draft in in type and then from there i keep working with it um yeah but and i have poems um you know some of these poems are collected in um chat books and literary journals and all those different things but what i did was just you know for the occasion just printed them out to have a stack um at hand and not be reading from a screen yeah nice. cool thank you yeah. I have two comments actually. Joan Hanley said magnolias were blooming for her son's birthday. They were blooming as I brought him home from the hospital, which is wonderful. Oh, that's a, yes, a wonderful omen for a very wonderful young man. Yes. <laughs> and Tori has some questions again. So how does the setting you inhabit affect your poetic lens? For instance, a good amount of your poems have metaphors to nature. And I wonder if you write outside or if you capture a feeling and write about it later, regardless of where you are. <laughs> um, yeah, let's see. I, th you know, that's a, that's interesting to reflect on. I mean, I can I can imagine there. I can remember, I should say, moments of being outside and, um, you know, dashing something down that I'm actually observing. But I think. I think more than that, um, it's after. So it's I'm in the experience, and the more um, intense the experience is, um, I'm more compelled to write about it after. And sometimes I'm out there in the kayak. You know, for those of my friends with whom I kayak, um, you know, beginning to you know look for words um, to to um, preserve. Um, some of the bliss of being at one um, with beloved people in a beloved place, that kind of thing. But then it's later, it's definitely later that I'm working on something. And then a lot of my poems um, have, you know, quite a few revisions. Um, but it was great, Tori. I feel like you had um, embedded in the question were all really good answers too. But I would say more than not, I am not I am writing at home, you know, in my in my room <laughs> or wherever I can. Yeah. My daughter and I were actually talking about that with the creative process because there's a difference about being present in the moment and capturing the moment. Once I move to capture it, I'm no longer present. It's a different process and I'm in a different place within myself. 
That's really what you're talking about. Yeah. Craig Maloski, I hope I pronounced your name right, says, your poems are wonderfully grounded in natural environments, yet you seem to sink into this special place from which the poems arise. Can you describe your process of entering into this place? You kind of just did it, but. <laughs> oh, Craig, thank you. Um, yeah, there are, they are environments, but that's a very, such a deep question of what is the inner environment actually that is giving rise to the words um i think well two things come to mind although i'll i'll be meditating and <laughs> you know trying to witness this in future um to learn more about it um one of the things is um well, clearly love um, that um, that stirs um, my creativity, that it's not enough to just receive, but I want somehow to respond to the created and ongoing creative natural world. Um, but the other thing is, um, is the magic of words and language. So I feel a receptivity to um, a sort of word ether, a stream of language, which is musical as well as imagistic. And so that is really, I guess I would have to say, Craig, that is really my, um, my doorway, my gateway, because it's one thing to feel, but then um, to have agency, and to act, to act um, I'm, I'm sort of, I'm catching <laughs> a word on the wind. I'm catching um, something of that energy of language that's going to um, hopefully correlate with, um, with a creativity that's greater than my own, if that makes sense, yeah. Yeah. Melissa was asking along that lines, when you write a poem about a memory, do you then recollect the memory differently? And I think you just answered that. It, it changes with the color of the language that comes forward and the inspiration that comes up. Would that be a correct way of rewording it? Um, yes, it's, that's, it's, it is interesting, isn't it? Because, um, you know, memory is a slippery slope also. <laughs> And you know, memory is filtered through. Um, we have a lot of different lenses, so to speak. Um, so, I mean, I think that's one of the. Um, I dare say one of the sad things that you know, I I can't a thousand percent recreate <laughs> um, that moment in time that I loved. I, I you know. Um, but so yeah, so Melissa, Melissa, it's it's a it's um it is an approximation, but at the same time, maybe um, something of my inner life um, has now superimposed on a moment something that's enriching also. So I I want to these are wonderful questions I, I could ponder beyond this moment. Great. Um, because we're, I'm so thinking about um, this one um, uh, this one moment I, I well again, here we go. <laughs> this is a conflation, I guess, of, of times um, that I wanted to do justice to. And um, I'll just read it to you. Um, and it is also a key to um, a philosophical underpinning. So I'm going to read a poem called Indra's Net. And um, it's an image that comes from Indian mythology, uh, Indra being a king of the gods. And Indra's net is an image really of this uh, net which extends um, infinitely across the cosmos. And at um, each place that the 
the ethereal ropes are knotted, there is a jewel. And each jewel reflects the jewels at every other nodule of this enormously generative and holding net. Um, so it's this, this great picture of um, everything, not only reflecting everything else that's happening everywhere and always, but that everything is influenced by what's happening in widespread space and time. It's an incredible concept, right? Um, so this is called Indra's net. Let's remember this hour forever, I nearly said, <laughs> and dropped the word overboard, forever that is, <laughs> dropped the word overboard like a coin. It didn't matter, we could touch time, make it ripple, trailing our fingers, new patterns flowed out to shore and to the mountain, our roots deep in water, even deeper in stone. Leaves falling also made us who we were in the fabric of the place. Still echoing one eagle's cry from the point to another's reply from the peak. Piercing blue, circles of space flying to its mate. Tunis turned to one and one into many wings at once as seeing swam with a watery sun. Its sparkling net caught us paddling home into the mountain shadow for supper. So this idea, everything but leaves falling also made us who we were in the fabric of the place. So I'll just pause and, and um, I know some of you experience that so deeply as well and are um, just dedicated to seeing yourself, oneself in the fabric. Um, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> so I think, um, I think I and we, um, that, that language and writing um, were challenged um, to do the impossible, um, to express, you know, the deepest grief and the greatest joy. Um, and while it's unattainable, ultimately, perhaps, um, it, it deepens us, the trying, and maybe helps us contain more of what um, life um, is made of. Um, but uh, let me see, I want to notice the time. <coughs> Let's just do a little bit more. Um, oh, I'll read Peaches. Um, so here was a, a joy that, um, I mean, it happened so long ago. You know, my daughter was just a little girl and, um, and sometimes it's just a peach, <laughs> something, right? Just um, awakens um, a long time ago, stumbling upon an abandoned orchard and um, <clears throat> having to overcome the, um, oh my God, I'm trespassing. <laughs> and then sort of getting into a whole mythical mindset, um, which I, I just um, led to this poem called Peaches. Wild sun, wild trees in the orchard that morning, gold and pink peach skin, a soft sun-made shade in a dawn stamped early with dew and delight. Once paradise transplanted here, I hardly dared, but for my daughter, why not? Summer light without a bonnet, a shine without a shadow, sheer pleasure I wanted for her 
this taste of first days discovered, soft and succulent, wind stirred, leaf lifted, this instant holding like a gift for later. I don't mean canning. I mean, we can, she can feel this good. Exquisite blush, golden rose, free, all free. No coins, no owner, no grocer, just Ari and me and the trees. Who knew a peach could be eaten? I felt the flame of the sword not yet lifted over the gate privilege of everything offered, taken as if no end to ripening, not yet underfoot, the rotten ones, the flies, the time flies. Wow. <laughs> Chloe Tyler says your poems encapsulate your essence so beautifully. It is such a rare pleasure to gift glimpse your inner life in a concentrated way. So deeply thoughtful, tender insights, always beautiful, humble, and remarkably profound. Oh, thank you, Shiloh. It's beautiful. Thank you so much. Alice Vogel and Elsie both bring science into this. Alice says, I just read that our brains rearrange memories to help us better approximate the events or experiences essence. And Elise says, Science has the concept that you can't measure something without changing that which you observe by reflecting so deeply on important moments and recording them so beautifully as you do, Patrice. You change the moments by keeping it from receding completely. It's marvelous, thank you. <laughs> Martina Westford, here in France, night has fallen. It has been an inspiring way for me to end the first day of spring by listening to your invigorating and healing words. And you do indeed inspire me to take up the pen. Martina, that's wonderful. Great to know that you're here. Thank you so much. Um, I'll just end, I guess, with one or two and then. That would be wonderful, Patrice. Um, I guess, yes, too, too devoted to, uh, to the garden. It seems the right thing. Um, and uh, it's just my nature to, to see the mythic <laughs> in it. Um, so, garden. Once I knew nothing but hunger and the fragrance of that apple. Mm. Though small, I was tall enough to grasp the round radiant secret one bite, sweet flesh of beginnings. Second bite, remembering the word forbidden, caught my breath and swallowed hard. Now I hunger for a taste of paradise. Though older, bold enough again to pluck a burning beauty, secret of secrets. One bite, naked as in the beginning, Second bite, ashamed but by what I know and do not do. Third bite and more, inheritance of joys and grief until I get to Eden's core and what the love of knowledge needs. I eat the seeds. And I'll just end with um, an Easter poem um, it's called The Story. When the man rose from death alive, the woman first to know, already risen herself and drenched in sweetness, dawn unraveled the winding sheet of waiting. Her heart tuned to the hour, silence softens stone, opens the latch to birdsong. Mary, turning, she was one nearest what can't be held, 
but whole, she rose again to tell. So thank you everyone for being with me today and Diane thank hosting. You are incredible, Patrice. I'm just so touched by your poems and your presence. Thank you very much. I'm very grateful. We do have some of her poems in um, our bookstore, so please feel free to go to drakeitarts.com and find our author's books there in our gift shop. And I'd like to ask you, if you've enjoyed this program, to please thank our sponsors. Here we go. <laughs> Marianne Dornice Goldman, Blue Shutter Web Design, the Massachusetts Cultural Council, as administered by the Bill Ricca, Chelmsford, Drakett, and Tewksbury Cultural Councils, Diane Song, and Anonymous. Thank you donors for always for your generosity. If you're interested in making these programs possible, please get in touch with us at drakettarts at gmail.com or drakettarts.com. We will have our art gallery shortly after this and at four we will have a flute player, Hawk Henrys, to delight you all. Thank you so much for coming. I really greatly appreciate this. Patrice. Thank you so much, Diane. And for those of you um, who would like to reach out to me on Facebook or email, um, I am hoping to have a website in the not too distant future. But for now, um, however you would like to be in touch, please do. Um, I can't thank you all enough. So Diane, blessings and um, everyone, a beautiful season to you. Yeah. And if you don't have Patrice's email, we'd be happy to forward things to her for you. So just let us know if you'd like to be in touch with her future. Thank you.